All right, so we've got a petition seeking Canada's withdrawal from the UN, which has sparked a political firestorm. Uh, so uh, over 71,000 signatures so far. This uh, was sponsored by the Conservative MP, Leslin Lewis, and she has faced sharp criticism from Liberal ministers since doing so. The petition, closing on February 7th, outlines concerns about Canada's involvement with the UN and its agencies, including the World Health Organization. Petitioners oppose the obligations and initiatives associated with the UN, particularly Agenda 2030 and its Sustainable Development Goals. They argue these programs compromise national sovereignty and individual autonomy due to their rapid implementation, perceived lack of transparency, and potential impact on cultural values and privacy rights. So what's your thoughts there? Do you think it's a, a, a plan of action that Canada should take in order to uh, pull out from the UN, or do you think the UN still serves a purpose? I don't think it serves a purpose whatsoever. I mean, the reality is none of these global organizations seem to. I'm not really sure they really serve much of a purpose ever. I mean, I'd have to do more research. I shouldn't say that. Like, But you, you know, one of the questions I ask is, what was the last great thing the... World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, or the United Nations did for our country specifically. I'm not saying they're not doing things in other parts of the world that might be helpful. Um, I believe there's always some sort of motive behind it, to be honest with you, at that level. Uh, but when you look at what they've done for Canada, it's next to nothing. You know what I mean? And, and if anything, like I see it sort of as, I see it sort of as a amplified version of, of Western ideology, for the most part. And what I mean by that is, you basically have all the cooks in the kitchen that run all these countries. They go there and they kind of use the UN um, as a megaphone to now implement these more harmful ideologies. You know, they've got like, for example, the UN is championing the global disinformation bills. So that happened uh, a couple months ago and it was actually a bill that came out of Canada and the Netherlands, I believe. And their whole idea was, look, uh, disinformation's wild and crazy and we, we, have to, we all have to get together and we have to stop this. So all the countries, you know, I think there's 35 nations that have signed it now. And they all go back to their country, and then they start implementing policy based on these rules. But basically what you're saying is now you have a world government, right? Um, and then, you know, you look at the WHO. Their pandemic response was horrible. And now they have complete control. Now there's the, the idea or there's this veil of they have complete control over how all these other countries need to behave for the next pandemic. And it's like, look, you said this the other day. You can't even take advice from a prime minister and spread that throughout the country because each province lives a different way. There are different needs. So how could one organization, one guy, basically, I know it's more than one guy, but it's one guy talking and I really don't like his face. Um, <laughs> how can you have one organization telling you how the whole world needs to manage this crisis? When in some places, like, was it Sweden? That, Sweden. Yeah, yeah. like they, they, had, they had basically no, no pandemic measures and they turned out better than everywhere else. You know, or even Florida in the States, you know what I mean? I think Texas was very similar. And these are just in little pockets. Like, you can't have one organization tell the rest of the world how they have to manage a situation, especially when it's varying in terms of its severity. It makes no sense at all. You know, and then with the World Economic Forum, I mean, these guys are just fucking, these guys are just, oh, these guys are just gangsters. It's actually kind of funny. Like, they're just trying to take over the world in the most nefarious ways. There's no way we should be involved with them in any way whatsoever. You that can't mean, even distinguish between the WEF and the UN anymore because they've openly signed on and have a legal agreement to push forward with the Agenda 2030 and right. what the WEF calls as the Great Reset. To it's the same same agenda, but they've openly signed on that. Yeah, they're they're working together on this. So I see no difference between those two organizations now. And what's crazy about that is. The concept of fascism itself, it's a word that gets tossed around way too much these days. And most people, uh, most, people make, most people make a false correlation between authoritarianism and fascism, where fascism, yes, it, there's o the obvious authoritarian aspect, but fascism is the merger of political and economic power. And so when you look at this, you go, okay, there's the UN, which is supposed the political power side, and the WEF, which is the representing the economic power. Yep. And it's like these two things coming together is fascism. And it's like I, I try not to – I don't like using that word because it is – it's become meaningless with its overuse now. Yeah, it's but, like using the word authentic. It's like, yeah, right, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah. dude. Yeah. But, yeah, it, to me, I, I, can't, I can't make a distinction between the two the two anymore yeah i mean the, the the biggest problem that i have is i think that we are so entrenched or embedded in these organizations that there's really no easy way out mm -hmm. right um 
for example, and I don't think this this is just an example I'll use because it's it's very recent, is you know in the most recent uh, I'm not sure which bill it was in the United States, but they implemented a uh, uh, like a a NATO a NATO clause to basically stop Trump from being able to pull out of NATO. So now if you want to pull out of NATO and you're the U.S., you need two thirds of the Senate support and you need to give them at least six months heads up. And you'll never get it because you'll never have two thirds of the Senate be Republican or Democratic. There's just no way. It's always going to be one or two votes. That's what it's going to be, right? So, um, you know, they're basically saying, "Hey, we're we're putting in safeguards now into our legislation that you can't you can't get through this. So you can't get out of the organization even if you want to." Now, I don't think uh, things like that exist, particularly for like the UN and the WHO. Um, but I, I imagine that there are other ways that the apparatus, the government apparatus does something like that, but it's just not as obvious. You know what I mean? Like you try to pull out, but there is all these stop measures, stop gap measures, whatever it's going to be in your way from you actually being able to pull away from it, you know? Um, but at the end of the day, like, like I said, like, can you think of anything good they've done for us? To me, I look at it as a useless organization at this point. That's just over, an overbloated bureaucracy. There's 40,000 UN employees. Wow. And the function of the UN, if you, if you were to say there is one, would be to essentially act as a mediator between nations all around the world. It's a, uh, it's, it's your circle table. That yeah. You can all sit down and have a chat at It's like, you're telling I me, call them a guidance counselor. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of like, what it is. It's like, you need 40,000 employees to do that. Yeah. Um, and then too, also from, uh, from like a military perspective, it's like the UN used to obviously have its peacekeepers, which now I start to, <laughs> now I start to view as very Orwellian. It's yeah. Like, it's like, it's like the Iranian morality police. That's exactly it's what like, it is, dude. It's like, oh but, God. but to, to me, it's, yeah, the UN is, uh, yeah, pretty much useless at this point. Yeah. I just, I, I guess I don't really, what I would say is if you look at the most recent actions of the UN, I think it's a good example. So there's been a lot of back and forth in the Israel Hamas war. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and you know, there, there, there's all these diplomatic arguments about you know, the u.s not supporting it or this or that or whatever but here's the reality it doesn't even matter if everyone supports it the there's no one has to listen to them mm -hmm. they don't they're not the rule of law in a sense right they're just there to try to that's what i'm saying they're just basically there to try to implement like harmful policy and harmful ideology at scale around the world and these these countries decide if they want to listen to or not and if they do listen to it they're like well the u.n said so like your your, your country being trudeau can say, well, the UN said we have to put in disinformation. Guys, this isn't even me. I'm not, I'm not the bad guy. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to save truth. This is what the UN said. All the countries are doing it. But then, so you know what I mean? You use it as like this, you use it as sort of a filter to work through when you're trying to implement these totalitarian fucking measures. Or you just don't listen. Like Israel's like, oh, how about fuck off? So yeah. we're gonna do this anyway. So it's it to me, it's basically just, yeah, it's become a weapon that the political elite can use to implement these larger scale, um, like I said harmful tools that really don't serve us in any well, way. Well, I even made, I made a video the other day talking about how it's not just Western nations that uh, weaponize the UN. The UN has been captured by some of the most oppressive and authoritarian regimes on the planet. Like I was talking about how the Islamic cooperation organization is the largest voting bloc in the UN. Right. So when things go to a vote in the UN, the, yeah, the Islamic nations, like the, the Iran's, the Saudi Arabia's, yeah. all of this that have, the Pakistans that have just a litany of human uh, rights violations, they're the ones sitting down and condemning, say, Israel. And I'm not saying that Israel isn't. Uh, I'm sure they have many things that in the past that they've been, uh, that should be condemned from a human rights perspective. But the fact that it's, these are the people that are making yeah. that judgment, it, to me, it just renders it uh, invalid. And then also, like, the craziest one is North Korea was appointed the head of council on disarmament. Yeah, what? And you're like, <laughs> you're like yeah, okay, this is the one that, this is the nation that's currently, that always is firing rockets off yeah. at South Korea, and then has been pursuing a nuclear arsenal for decades. Yeah. It's just, it's a joke. And yeah, no, I agree. I think. Even, too, but... actually, one thing, like, to point out is that China never gets any human rights violations. That's the amount of capture that has happened in this organization right. where israel gets like over hundreds yeah. which again sure maybe is is valid but the fact that china has none when they currently have 1.5 million uyghurs locked up in a con in concentration camps they've killed over 1.5 million tibetans since the 1950s like where is any of this coming through the un or any condemnation or bad press or china so it's i'm like, saying yeah yeah it's all basically a charade it's just at scale 
You know what I mean? Like I say, every, all these organizations are, are, pardon me, all these organizations are captured via some sort of political ideology um, for money or for power. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, I, it doesn't, take your pick, it doesn't matter. But I mean, like they wouldn't even, like I'm not really, I don't want to get too deep into the Taiwan, China, what the name of the country is thing, but the UN wouldn't even recognize Taiwan, wouldn't even say Taiwan as a country because China's got so much capture over the organization. Like, obviously it's polluted. Well, that's even the uh, official US stance as well, that Taiwan is still part of China. It's one of those things where they just don't want to piss them off as well. But yeah, to your point, it's just, it's just captured. And I even just have an issue with the concept of, you know, what we were talking about with the uh, top-down ruling approach is, you know, I, I've said this before, but like 99 point, or the smartest person is still ignorant of 99.9% .9 of knowledge and truth. Right. And so it's like, you need as many uh, decision-making data points in making any movement forward as to what would be progress. The idea of getting one organization or a very small group of people to sit down and then go, okay, we know what's best for everybody. It's just, that's, it's the, absolutely insane. The, the the amount of opportunities for that to go completely haywire. And I mean, now you see them talking about stuff like the uh, the the head of the WHO is just on there saying how we need to stop uh, and cut back on agriculture, you know, attack the farmers like they're currently doing in Germany, all this kind of stuff. And I mean, they're doing it here too. But it's like the idea that some dude on the other side of the world can tell us in Canada what we should be doing for our agricultural practices it's like go fuck yourself well it makes no sense right so they're doing it from like an environmental perspective not realizing okay what is the what is its contribution to our economy how many people does it feed how significant is this so that the rest of the the rest of canada continues to operate effectively or efficiently in any way shape or form which it doesn't really but yeah exactly like you you when you're in the thick of things when you live in this country when you're maybe the prime minister then down to the premier and then you know your municipal government they understand the ramifications of all these movements and the further away you get the further you, the, the less you know about every single thing that you're doing. So when you try to make these decisions from the top down like that, looking at the whole world, there's actually no way that it's an effective form of governance at all, right? So for me, I think it would be wise for us to get out. Um, unfortunately, I don't see it happening anytime soon. You know, the one thing that I would maybe, you know, say is our, maybe like, maybe the one way, the one road I could see is going down rather where I could see this maybe ending in the next 10 to 20 years is because of the East-West divide. Because, you know, you're looking at this BRICS development. I think if BRICS develops a lot over the next 10, 15, 20 years, you might see these countries separate in more ways than just economics. They'll separate politically. They're obviously militarily. Um, and so, so the UN might be one of those things that falls where you kind of have your own separate East UN, West UN, or whatever it is. I still think it's bad to see these organizations, you know, one for each side of the world. I still think that's terrible, but I think that's the only way I would see us pulling out or getting out of it anytime soon um, and then sort of reorganizing ourselves from there. For sure. And something to keep in mind going into the next 